Good morning, um, everyone. Uh, my name is Heaven Crawley. I'm head of equitable development and migration at the UN University's Center for Policy Research, the UN's uh, think tank here in New York. Um, I'm also director of the MIDEC Hub, which is our partner for this event. I'd like to very warmly welcome you to this third UNUCPR Migration Policy Roundtable, which really focuses on understanding uh, better the relationships between uh, climate change and uh, uh, mobility in the context of urbanization, with a focus really on the countries of the Global South, who've arguably, arguably contributed far less to the process of climate change, but um, are really having to deal with the consequences of that now. Um, a few words of introduction uh, and about the format of the event before we begin. Um, in terms of the context, I mean, many of you will be familiar with the World Bank's Groundswell uh, report, which was published in uh, 2021, and that report suggested that climate change is an increasingly potent um, driver in migration, and indeed that it could force something around 216 million people um, across the world to move by 2050. And the report highlighted hotspots of climate-related migration emerging uh, as early as 2030, um, and also suggested that unless we find immediate and concerted action to address uh, global emissions, to support green and inclusive and resilient development, um, that there would be uh, really very serious consequences. Importantly, the report also argues that climate change um, is a powerful driver of internal migration because of the way it impacts on people's livelihoods and their loss of livability in highly exposed um, locations. And I think one of the reasons why we wanted to have this event is that this complexity of those relationships between climate change and mobility is often lost in the political um, and media debates about the relationships between climate change and migration. And what we see in many of our countries is really very simplistic narratives that assume a linear relationship, if you like, between climate change and uh, migration. And those narratives often make quite misleading claims, actually, about climate-induced mass migration from the global south to the nor global north, often focusing, for example, on um, migration from America, uh, from Africa to Europe. Um, so I think, you know, one of the aims of this event really is to try and unpack and uh, make more, comp reveal the complexity of those relationships. We know, for example, that contrary to popular belief, uh, most climate related mobility is likely to take place in the global south, not from south to north, and that it's mostly likely to be within even rather than between uh, countries. So this focus on internal migration. People actually very rarely move beyond borders if they migrate related to climate change. They're much more likely to tend to move to cities, for example, within their own countries um, because of the perceived employment, education and healthcare opportunities that those urban areas offer. So cities then, as a kind of engine, if you like, of economic growth and sites of social dynamism, really are a very important site of our analysis when we're thinking about uh, what these relationships might be. Mobility can be a very important and effective strategy for adaptation to climate change, particularly in those contexts. And we're gonna hear a lot more about that today from our very uh, learned speakers on this topic. So what we want to do in this, in this um, round table, as I say, is really to, to look at the evidence very clearly that we have at our disposal about the relationships between climate change and migration, and to unpack uh, those relationships, particularly where there are uh, context of rapid processes of social and economic change and indeed transformation in, in some places. Um, we also want the discussion to be solutions focused. So I will be asking our speakers to try and, you know, really think about what the implications are for us in terms of, you know, our role as academics, as policymakers, or indeed as practitioners. And we're going to hear um, some of those uh, ideas in the presentation themselves. And following the event, we'll produce a brief summary of the key themes of the discussion, which will be published online, and you'll receive a copy of that. So we've organized this event, as I say, with the MIDEC Hub. The MIDEC Hub is one of the world's, arguably the world's largest migration research projects, and it focuses on the relationships between migration development and inequality in the context of the global south. Now, MIDEC doesn't focus specifically on climate related uh, migration but what it does try to do is to situate mobility in the context of these broader structural inequalities with which migration can be associated so just a few words really then to just set the scene and, and the and the idea that underpins this event in terms of what we're trying to um, get out of it and i think we have some very excellent speakers to help us do that and what i'm going to do is to introduce our speakers um as, as they present their work. 
and then we'll open up the floor, the screen rather, to, to you in the audience. If you've got any comments or points or questions that you'd like to raise, we'll have some time for that discussion and, and a discussion hopefully also between um, the panelists. And we'll conclude with some brief um, concluding remarks from the speakers and perhaps one takeaway message, if you have one, about the implications of this you know, complexity um, in terms of what it means for policy and practice. And I just want to also note that the the event is being recorded so that we can share this recording with those who are not able to attend. So very delighted to have you all with us, very delighted to have our speakers. And uh, without further ado, I would really like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Yin Ho Chung is a research fellow here at UNUCPR. He holds a PhD in human geography from University College London. Um, his research and publications have really focused on climate change adaptation and climate migration, with a focus in particular on Ethiopia, and also on the related issues of power dynamics and social inequalities with which that migration is associated. Uh, Yin Ho has previously worked for the Rift Valley Institute, for UNDP in Ethiopia, and the University of Oxford. And Yin Ho, we're delighted, first of all, to have you as a fellow at UNUCPR, uh, but also to hear about some of your research specifically in the context of Ethiopia. So the screen is yours. You have um, 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evan. Uh, let me share my screen first. So I assume that you can see my screen clearly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Heaven, for the nice introduction. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm Jin Chung, working as a research fellow at the UNUCPR. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss an overview of climate mobility debate in the context of urbanization and structural inequalities uh, with a case study from Ethiopia. So today, my presentation has four sections. So firstly, I will start with a brief overview of climate mobility debate taking place currently. And then secondly, I'm going to discuss about the systematic review of literature on the relationship between climate change, migration, and urban development over the last 10 years that a group of researchers in Oxford, including me, uh, has published quite recently in urban climate. And the third section will be about a case study of young Ethiopian smallholders heading to Addis Ababa, who after being affected by climate change in their home in rural areas. And the last topic will briefly cover the implication for policy in this regard. So I can start with an overview of climate mobility debate taking place currently. So public interest in climate migration has dramatically increased over the last decade. As you can see from the graph and the simple search on Google using the terms climate and migration shows the rapid growth in the number of times being searched uh, since 2011. The relationship between climate change and human migration has also interested academic researchers and policymakers. To some extent, uh, this reflects that migration away from climate vulnerable areas can be an effective strategy of climate change adaptation. However, the migration continues to be perceived in overly simple terms, either as a successful livelihood diversification strategy or the outcome of a failure to adopt on the part of those who move. So, however, there is a growing evidence that the picture is significantly more complicated than it seems. Even when people migrate for reasons related to climate change, political and economic structures, as well as social and cultural norms, play an important role in shaping migration decisions and processes. This is, for example, reflected in migration patterns that follows rules that established many years prior to the rapid climate change. So how is climate change affecting human migration? Obviously, this will be further explained by Roman later in the, in the round table, uh, but answers to this question are still improving. One influential narrative is that climate refugees fleeing specific environmental crisis in the global south will generate new mass migration flows into the global north. The research, including the World Bank's Groundswell report, has already challenged this narrative. Most people who move due to environmental changes in their home rarely cross an international border. Yet, these claims about climate-induced mass migration continue 
new surface in media and public policy domains, as you can see from the Guardian article published just a couple of months ago. In this regard, the emergence of the term climate-related mobility reflect a new interpretation of climate response better tuned to structural inequalities, economic precarity, and political event. Here, climate-related mobility refers to both voluntary and involuntary uh, multi-directional movement of people for regions related to the consequence of climate change, but on top of other social, economic, and political regions. Whereas the term migration generally implies the permanent change of residence from one country to another. So in other words, climate migrants don't necessarily only refer to people directly affected and subsequently relocated by fast onset climate change, such as hurricane or flood. They also include people who are affected by slow onset climate change, such as increasingly frequent drought event and go through multiple decision-making processes of whether, when, and where to move at household or individual levels. So now I'm going to briefly discuss about the systematic review of literature on, on this relationship between climate change, migration, and urban development published over the last 10 years. So, Migrating from climate sensitive areas can be an effective strategy of climate adaptation, obviously, but as I discussed briefly, contrary to popular belief, people rarely move beyond the borders. Instead, actually they move to cities because of the perceived employment, education, or healthcare opportunities that cities offer. As engines of development and the site of social dynamism and economic flux, cities are particularly attractive for people in climate vulnerable rural areas where climate events such as drought or heat waves complicate existing livelihood opportunities that were already challenged by poverty, economic inequality, and population growth. However, moving to cities is not a panacea and the migrant may face different types of challenges such as urban flood, unhygienic living conditions, or competitive daily job market in cities. These insights are increasingly reflected in shifting research priorities. In order to better understand these research trends and gaps, a group of researchers at the University of Oxford, including me, undertook a systematic review of literature on the relationship between climate change, migration, and urban development published over the last 10 years. The systematic review, just if I briefly explain is a comprehensive and systematic assessment of the existing literature uh, on a complex theme, such as climate migration, in an organized and synthesizable manner with minimum degree of bias in order to understand the current status of knowledge. For this topic of climate migration, initially more than a thousand publications, both policy and academic uh, literature were considered, and then a subset of 173 publications were selected and reviewed in a greater depth. And this review was recently published in Urban Climate. So the result of the systematic review shows that there is a clear shift in orientation towards climate-related migration and cities. Almost half of the reviewed document focused explicitly on the city level. And the dominance of this scale was particularly prominent in 2019 and 2020. Within the city-oriented literature, there is a strong emphasis on capital and larger cities, with less attention paid to small and medium-sized cities. Although disproportionately, this attention is given to larger cities, is pretty common across the wider urban studies literature, the pattern observed suggests that the bigger means more important is still pervasive in this field of study. The, also, there are quite significant geographical differentiations. The fast onset climate change, particularly flood and cyclones, was more discussed in South Asia, whereas the converse was true for Sub-Saharan Africa with a strong focus on desertification. This difference may have policy implications for the temporal and the spatial uh, nature of movement in those regions. 
So in conclusion, our systematic reviews shows the growing significance of the urban lens through which climate-related mobility is understood. It demonstrates why it is so important to consider the dynamics of the urban system that would be affected by both climate-related migrants and the impact of climate change. Climate-related mobility into cities has significant implications for urban development and the realization of urban policy objectives, including the achievement of the sustainable development goals. The pressures on urban infrastructure for housing, employment, water and sanitation, public health and transportation may be exacerbated, and the climate-related migrant could become disproportionately dependent on the informal system of cities. So, so I'll briefly explain how these discussions is actually would look like in, in practice with a case study of Ethiopia. So Ethiopia is a particularly interesting country to study in this regard. Not only is it a country that experienced drought with the varying levels of intensity and frequency, it is also the second most populous country in Africa with unequal and highly politized polit politicized uh, land tenure systems. Although the country is predominantly rural, quite still, it has one of the fastest urbanization rate in the world, reaching almost 5% a year. In Ethiopia, the adverse impact of climate change is mainly longer dry season, followed by shorter rainy season with much heavier rainfall, which cause severe soil erosion which washes nutritious topsoil and negatively affects agricultural productivity. Our research has found that climate-related mobility in Ethiopia is commonly practiced by young smallholders who go to cities for temporary job opportunities as unskilled manual laborers during the off-farm season, which is between November and February. We also found that those young smallholders confront different types of social and economic structure constraints between rural and urban space, and their movement options and patterns are sensitive to drought and its impact on agricultural productivity. However, to suggest that Ethiopia's mobility history is only a recent history related to climate change conceals important structural issues and the aspiration of those young smallholders. Non-climate factors often shape mobility decisions and determine whether, when, and where those young smallholders move. In particular, our research has identified two highly influential structural issues. The first, the rural land tenure system, and second, the urban environment. The firstly, access to land is crucial, as we all know, for the livelihood of smallholders. One of the major challenges facing Ethiopia is land scarcity and the rising number of landless young people in rural areas. Over the last 30 years, the population has more than doubled from 50 to 120 million, 120 million and more than 70% of those population is under, under the age of 29. The young people in Ethiopia have historically relied on land inheritance to access land. However, as Ethiopia's population density has grown, household farm size have decreased substantially. More than half of the country's rural farming household now cultivate less than one hectare of land. As their prospect for land inheritance have dwindled, many have opted to leave their home villages for non-agricultural income activities or for further education in cities. State ownership of land is also quite an important issue in Ethiopia because it affects mobility decisions. Successive regimes stretching back to imperial times have maintained a policy of land nationalization. Rural smallholders have therefore accepted that their land holdings are not permanent property, but temporary allocation that could be reduced or confiscated at a moment notice. 
This dependence on the state has reduced land tenure security, convincing younger generations that they are left with no choice but to leave. The strict state control over land management also influenced mobility patterns in various ways. Since land cannot be sold in Ethiopia as it is nationalized, people are often discouraged from migrating permanently if they own any size of land. And if they decide to migrate, they often feel that they have to leave some family members behind, mostly wives and children, to look after that property. Mobility history in Ethiopia is also important. Historically, the most common form of mobility in Ethiopia was ruler to ruler. As migrants searched for temporary opportunities in large scale commercial farms, such as sugarcane plantations during the off farm season, as I said, between November to February. These farms were owned by the government of Ethiopia or foreign companies in the far Beni Shangul and Gumuz and Gambela region. Since the 2000s, however, the mobility patterns have shifted and are now increasingly directed toward urban areas. This shift has happened for two main reasons. Firstly, large-scale agriculture in Ethiopia is becoming an increasingly risky business due to climate change. Most cash crop farming, including sugarcane, is extractive and sensitive to shift in temperature and rainfall. Severe drought in 2011 and 2012 confirmed for many migrants that there were no alternative job opportunities available in those large-scale commercial farms when the farms failed. Secondly, a series of ethnic conflict persuaded migrants to avoid regions where they are obviously seen as outsiders. Ethiopia has more than 80 ethnic groups, and then because of their accent, because of the language, it is quite easy to be recognized if you are in different regions. This trend has become even more prominent due to the country's recent civil war. The most popular destination for migrants is currently in Ethiopia is Addis Ababa, the capital city of the country, which is melting pot of diverse ethnic groups. And moving to Addis Ababa is seen as a lower risk option than moving to other regions or our other regional cities or large scale farms, which was previously popular. Mobility patterns and migrant experience in Ethiopia is further shaped by the urban environment. While cities generally provide a wide range of employment opportunities, the limitation of citizenship, living conditions, and job security often generate structural barriers that restrict migrant mobility in a number of ways. The firstly, there are bureaucratic barriers for migrants to obtain permanent legal residence in cities in Ethiopia. Without an ID card, migrants are, legal, migrants are not legally recognized, and this affects their access to health and education services. Secondly, migrants tend to go to informal settlement upon arrival unless they have existing network in cities. And the living conditions, including hygiene, sanitation, and water availability in this informal settlement are often much worse than their rural homes. Finally, the informal labor market in cities is really, really competitive in Addis Ababa because a limited number of jobs available daily, particularly for non-skilled manual laborers. This will be further, explain, further explained, Sarah, in the later session. And then the last, section of my presentation is implications for policy. The climate-related mobility reflects the weak position of young smallholders embedded between rural and urban spaces and their vulnerability to recurrent drought event in Ethiopia. Their mobility only partly functions to spread the risk and reflect the land shortage and urban job opportunities in addition to climate change. Moreover, Mobility is historically integrated, as I explained earlier, into smallholder farming system and is part of seasonal farming cycles. 
Young smallholders in Ethiopia need long-term policy support that considers larger structural issues. Firstly, land tenure security must be improved in the context of land scarcity, land nationalization, and recurrent drought. The secondly, the informality and temporality of climate-related mobility need to be addressed in the urban policy context. The policy coherence is also quite essential at the national level. Other policy areas, such as urban housing or rural development, also affect people's mobility. And policies need to be designed in a manner that reduces regional and social inequality. This policy aspect will be further explained by Dina in the later session. And that is all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jin Hung. That was a very um, comprehensive overview, actually, of the, the kind of state of the art, if you like, in general. But also, I think that case study of Ethiopia is very interesting because, you know, when we hear about migration from Ethiopia in the kind of broader narratives, we often here it's spoken about as if people move from rural areas to the north and of course the north as in the global north and of course what happens is they mostly move to the urban areas and then the conditions of life in those urban areas may be what determines any decision to move onwards and i think that's a really critical you know insight or, or opportunity for policy engagement around some of these issues that are, is being neglected really because of this focus on uh, the migration outside of Ethiopia rather than inside so it's really really helpful and thank you also for sticking to the time um we've posted a couple of uh, links in the chat on the chat function that hopefully uh, everyone can see of your blogs your recent blogs for UNUCPR really summarizing some of these issues and we'll also um, share your slides if that's possible in terms of uh, people getting access to some of that information so very grateful indeed to that. We'll come back. I'm sure there's many um, put comments or questions arising, but that's a very good way of, of setting the scene. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's turn now to Roman. Uh, Roman, welcome and uh, thank you uh, for joining us today. I'd like to warmly welcome uh, you to the session. Uh, Roman is research group leader and research scholar in the Social uh, Cohesion Health and Wellbeing Research Group at the International Institute for Applied Social Systems Analysis. Uh, Roman holds a PhD in economics from the University of Vienna and degrees in sociology and economics from the University of Munich. And in his research, as we'll hear, Roman studies the relationship between environmental change and population dynamics, as well as the resulting implications for sustainable um, development. We're very glad to have you here, Roman. Uh, the screen is yours. Uh, you have 10 minutes, so thank you. Oh, I have a question for you, actually, before we start. Sorry. I sure, it's good. Um, um, just in terms of the, these debates that we've touched on already in terms of the introduction mm -hmm. and, and Yinho alluded to at the beginning of his presentation, um, this debate about whether we need to see migration as a successful livelihood diversity, diversification strategy or as an outcome of the failure to adapt, it seems to me there's quite a kind of disjuncture here about these different approaches. So I was wondering really how you see that relationship. Um, is it a failure or is it a, a potential success in terms of the adaptability strategy? Thank you. Thank you very much, Heaven, and thank you a lot also for this uh, question. I can already say there's no easy answer to this uh, question. Um, I will share my screen as I have also prepared a number of slides for the meeting today. And you should see my screen in full screen mode now. We can. And thank before you. starting, I would just like to thank you very much for inviting me be to, to be part of this roundtable today and also for organizing this uh, very timely event. In my presentation, I would like to make three, three uh, main points about the links between climate change adaptation and mobility, and generally the role of migration um, for adaptation. First, I would like to stress the importance of the local context in shaping on one side, the extent to which households are exposed and vulnerable to climate change, and on the other side, their abilities and options to respond and adapt to this impact, including the ability to migrate. Second, I would like to question a little bit the notion of adaptation in different contexts and argue for a stronger focus in research and policy on the well being of migrants, their families, and the destination and origin communities. And finally, I would like to highlight some of the particular adaptation challenges and opportunities that arise from migration to cities, which are expected in many parts of the world to see um, a growth, in particular in Africa, we expect to see quite a substantive growth over the next decades to come. As a first point, 
I would like to highlight once more, it was already mentioned before by the previous speakers, the diversity in responses to climatic stress and the underlying complexity that um, defines this topic. Um, there is responses that are determined by the social, economic, political, cultural, and also ecological context in the different areas um, where climatic stress is experienced. Most importantly, there is no deterministic relationship between climate change and migration, but there is rather a multitude of different factors that influence mobility responses of households. While some households become mobile, mobile there's also others that remain immobile, even when they are exposed to climatic stresses. And there's different reasons why they remain immobile. Some may face a lower exposure or vulnerability to a hazard and may hence not experience a strong pressure to migrate. Others may have a strong motivation to stay in their home regions, for example, for cultural or social reason, reasons, or simply because of a personal attachment to where they uh, are from. And other households may not be able to become mobile due to limited resources and capacities, potentially leaving them in a very vulnerable state where they are unable to escape um, uh, and move away from a hazard. And this multiplicity of different responses is very important when we think about the links between climate change adaptation and mobility. Adaptation and mobility are influenced by the resources, as I said, and adaptive capacities that are available to households and communities. And they have to be understood very much against the background of the wider socioeconomic development context in an area and the adaptation options available to households. We have, um, in a recent systematic review study, looked at 89 original case studies from communities in drylands in Sub-Saharan Africa that have explored the linkages between environmental stress, adaptation, and mobility. And here you see uh, the locations of these different case studies uh, that we have looked at. So it's also a systematic review similar to the one that Jin Hon Ho has uh, presented before. In this study, we found that households really use a diverse range of strategies to respond to environmental hardships in different livelihood and ecological contexts. So again, context really matters a lot. While migration is common in some areas, it is of less relevance to others. And it can take various forms, including shorter and seasonal forms of mobility that involve only selected uh, members of a household. What is interesting is that our findings also indicate that migration is often used as a complementary strategy to other forms of adaptation and very closely linked and embedded in these other forms of adaptation. So again, seeing migration only in isolation as a singular response to environmental stress might not be sufficient in this context. So the question is, can migration be an effective form of adaptation overall? Also here, it is important to consider the context and distinguish between different population groups. For some groups, indeed, under certain circumstances, migration can be an effective form of adaptation by allowing them to gain additional income, diversify income sources, and spread risks, um, for example, by having different household members living in different locations. For others, on the other hand, mobility can lead, lead to increased vulnerabilities and a po poverty spiral, which is in the end reducing the adaptive capacities. And we have seen uh, some examples presented in the previous presentation where people ended up in a worse off situation after having migrated. Again, existing inequalities and development challenges affect to a large extent whether we see um, a more or less positive outcome of migration, and whether migration can ultimately improve the situation and adaptive and coping capacities of households and individuals. Here, what is important, um, it is not only financial resources that matter, but also social capital, information, and access to knowledge and skills as these can shape the opportunities to large extents of migrants that they would um, ex uh, experience in their uh, prospective destinations. In this regard, it is very much my view, my belief, um, that it's crucial to rethink a little bit the ways of how we understand and assess whether mobility is good for adaptation or leads to improvements in the overall situation, and to broaden our view to consider really the well-being outcomes of these processes um, for migrants and their families primarily. Because it's important um, to understand whether mobility has effectively led for them to a subjective improvement of their situation or not. Here it is also crucial once more to recognize that migration can involve significant social, economic, and health risk for migrants and their families, and that many migrants may not be able to succeed 
in achieving their personal goals and wishes in the migration process. Research and policy on these topics should really focus on understanding better what the impacts are on the broader well-being of populations and affected groups. This topic and these issues are particularly relevant when we talk about climate adaptation and the migration nexus from an urban perspective. As we heard before, climate-related migration is primarily internal, so within the borders of a country and with an increasingly large, larger number um, of migrants moving also to, to urban centers, as we, as we have seen uh, before, um, for the case of Ethiopia. And this has in, in turn, of course, multiple implications, uh, again, for climate adaptation and mitigation efforts in these urban settings that are quite interesting uh, to understand. There's a great need to understand these better. Um, a particularly strong urban growth um, has been observed in Africa. So I have here um, a figure that shows you some of the fastest growing cities in Africa based on data from the UN urban population pros prospects and that predict that some cities um, would even double in size um, by the year 2020, uh, 2035. These include cities such as uh, Dar es Salaam, Kampala and Ouagadougou, which already today um, are home to several million inhabitants. So one can imagine what that means also for an urban context if the um, population size increases by such an amount in such a period. Um, so that is something when we talk about these topics that is really very important. It is particularly important because it would have implications for multiple aspects of adaptation and well-being in these uh, living environments, for example, related um, to um, housing, health risks, transportation, um, environmental um, um, quality, security and public services. Also in this context, issues related to social inequality and poverty play an important role because they determine ultimately the accessibility of basic infrastructures and living standards um, with people uh, for, for different uh, population groups. What we see is that uh, particularly people living in impoverished areas and informal settlements are particularly disadvantaged and deprived in many of their basic needs. And here, um, again, we see that a, a large number of migrants that are coming in these, uh, into, into, into these uh, rapidly growing cities, they actually uh, live in, in informal settlements and are exactly confronted with many challenges in achieving and um, basically a decent uh, living uh, uh, conditions. And today, more than 1 billion people are living in informal settlements all around the world, um, in particular in Eastern and Southeastern Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as Central and Southern Asia. Cities can hence present new risks and challenges for migrants, um, including um, being exposed to uh, overcrowding, pollution, social exclusion, which can also exacerbate their existing vulnerabilities and increase also exposure and vulnerabilities to climate impacts. At the same time, and this I just want to mention, we can discuss this maybe uh, later in greater detail, cities of course also offer new opportunities um, for migrants to diversify livelihoods, to access services and resources that they may not be able to access in, in rural areas um, and can also um, basically help them to improve their lives. There. So there's certainly also some opportunities on that side and um, both in terms of adaptation, but also in terms of mitigating uh, uh, climate, uh, climate change um, um, due to potentially different lifestyles. Um, what is important and I would like to close here is that when we look at challenges related to the rapid urbanization and increasing uh, inflow of migrants, that these, of course, also relate to questions of uh, resilience and novel climate risks that are coming up, um, to which um, migrants may be particularly exposed to. We know that larger population sizes and higher density, including due to migration, can increase the exposure to hazards. And we know that urban poverty can increase vulnerability to climate impacts. This in turn can result in increased displacement risks in urban areas, which we already see today. So I have here plotted uh, a figure from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center where they compared um, the occurrence of displacement in urban versus rural contexts, where we can see that already today, um, a large share of the uh, people who are being displaced due to um, disaster events um, are living in urban areas. So that is definitely a very important topic also, how to deal in the future with um, upcoming and increasingly aggravated uh, climate risks in these areas and how to best uh, protect uh, people. 
So adaptation policies and interventions in urban areas must be designed to address really the specific needs of migrants and other vulnerable populations, while also taking into account the broader social and environmental implications of urbanizations. And with this, I would like to stop here, showing once more the main uh, points of my short intervention. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Roman. Your intervention may have been short, but it was incredibly uh, insightful in terms of what it, it, it kind of the extra layer that it's added to Jin Ho's presentation in terms of that complexity. I particularly like um, the kind of focus around well-being of migrants, because so much of what we hear in this discussion is about the movement of where people go, but very little about uh, the consequences of that for migrants and also, of course, their families. And again, you sort of pulled out the social inequality points, you know, not just in terms of resources, but in terms of social capital and, you know, the extent to which that then shapes whether or not the migration move ends up being for the individual and for the family, um, the best strategy, I guess, uh, in that context. So again, really, really helpful. I don't doubt that there'll be uh, comments and questions. We already have a very good one relating to gender that's been placed in the Q&A. So if you have questions or comments, uh, for our speakers, please do add them to the Q&A. Um, thank you. We'll come back, uh, I'm sure, to some of those points. Um, I'd like to hand over now. We've had already two excellent presentations, um, and we go a little bit more complex and a little bit more detailed uh, by handing over to Sarah Rosengarter. Um, Sarah is, welcome, Sarah. Sarah is here with us in New York as Global Lead of Knowledge and Practice at the Global Center for Climate Mobility, um, which was established to advance evidence-based regional approaches and locally anchored solutions that address the impacts of climate change on the movement of people. We're hearing a lot here about the importance of evidence, but also locally anchored uh, approaches that really take account of context. Um, Sarah has served as a consultant for the UN uh, Institute for Training and Research, as well as uh, the UNDP, and was a former advisor uh, to the UN Special Representative of the Secretary, Secretary General on uh, International Migration, uh, Peter Sutherland. Sarah, we, we know um, that many cities in the global south are already struggling to provide services to residents. We heard you know, one billion people living in informal settlements. Uh, and so access to housing, to health and education is already uh, challenging. How do you see the role of cities um, in the kind of climate change and mobility nexus? And, and what do you think the policy implications that we can uh, take from that? We've heard of some of those already, uh, but I really, listen, I really look forward to hearing your additional uh, remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Heaven, and thank you to Jin Ho and um, the team for inviting me. Um, I will also share a presentation. Um, just a couple of words on how I have come to this topic of cities and urbanization. My background is much more on migration governance and policy, but I was involved over the last few years in efforts to strengthen the voice and role of mayors and cities in global migration governance and international discussions on migration um, through the establishment of the Mayor's Migration Council, the Mayor's Mechanism to the Global Forum on Migration and Development, and the Africa-Europe Mayor's Dialogue. And so in the context of supporting the um, establishment of these different bodies, I've worked with mayors and city officials um, exactly on this nexus of climate and migration. Um, including with the C40 and MMC Mayor's Task Force on Climate and Migration. So my presentation is informed by the work that we have done as the Global Center for Climate Mobility in Africa. I'll share some of our research findings, but then also from this work with um, city governments. So that's by way of introduction. Um, Colleagues have already worked uh, esta established um, the evidence base here. I'll share um, what we have come across in a much more brief literature review on the links between climate mobility and urbanization. Um, generally, I think we can say that yes, much movement is going to cities, but there is some variability across regions. And I think if we look at Africa in particular, and Roman, you showed the, the very high rate of urban growth, a lot of that I think is important to keep in mind is really driven by urban population growth in cities. So it's it's not necessarily the primary driver is not necessarily movement. It is a lot of it is move, is growth within cities. Um, you have some cases, and I think um, this came forward also in your conceptual framework, Roman, of people actually being less able to move towards cities because climate impacts negatively affect the resources of the household. And so there's this question of how many people may actually 
want to move but be unable to move. And we have some data on this from our work in Africa. Um, what I found interesting research findings was around um, kind of the composition of the urban economy and how that could matter in terms of the, um, I guess, impacts of climate shocks in rural areas and how much they affect urban destinations. So if you have very integrated economies between rural and urban areas, there tends to be actually less of an incentive to go to the city if the economy goes down in rural areas versus if you have a more diversified urban economy with more service sector jobs and so on, there is um, there's a more pronounced effect of kind of the city be a draw when, um, when conditions deteriorate in rural areas. Um, another interesting interplay um, that has been observed by research done for the Mayor's Migration Council um, was the project, projected increase in urban uh, rural urban migration in Central America uh, in dependence to the US border policy. So um, their projection suggested that if the US has a more um, restrictive border policy, this increases pressure on urban destinations in origin countries. Not so surprising, but I think int interesting to take into account, like how do these international migration dynamics intersect also with rural urban migration dynamics. Um, and another um, finding that we have observed and that came also from Jin Ho's presentation is that really we have to think of mobility as something that's not necessarily unidirectional. So it's not necessarily just people going from rural areas to urban areas, but there's a lot of circularity in there. And often also a lot of um, kind of multiplicity of locations across which households spread themselves. So um, you find uh, much more kind of connectivity that, that results between different places where members of a household may be spread across rural, peri-urban and urban areas. And that I think has implications for policymaking. So our findings from the work in Africa, this was done in collaboration with the Mixed Migration Center based in Geneva. They conducted field research for us in these seven locations in Africa, where they interviewed people both through surveys and interviews in total about a thousand people. So it's a small sample, but it was to get an indication of how climate realities are currently perceived um, and how they affect people's decisions to move or not. What we found is that um, people across all the locations with the exception of Alexandria, and I'll speak to that a little, um, were very much uh, observing or conscious of climate impacts negatively affecting their lives and livelihoods. Um, yet across most locations, people did not have an intention to move. Um, and about a quarter of respondents said they would want to move if they could, but they did not feel like they had the resources or the means to move. So this quarter is what Jinho referred to as kind of the trap populations potentially, right? Like people that have aspiration to move, but feel unable to move. What was interesting is that the aspirations to move were generally higher in urban areas. Although again, like there's some variety across the three urban centers and I'll discuss those a little bit more. Um, and we also found that what in the rural areas, people that wanted to go or were moving towards cities were mostly going to smaller towns, smaller urban centers that are close by, not necessarily the big uh, capital cities. Um, and here um, are our findings as they relate to how prevalent kind of the climate factor featured in people's decisions to move. Um, and you can see that the economic uh, uh, motivations that are pictured at the top of the graph here um, are quite prevalent in most locations. So people cited livelihood um, and income as, as more strong motivations. Um, but there were some exceptions, especially in places that had seen more recent and more severe climate impact. So Bera, you can see here, severe flood um, damage was observed and people were actually very keen on moving. But a lot of them um, in Bera, I think 90% of people said they would want to move. 60% had actually 
experience of moving in the past, but a lot of them had returned. So after um, Vera was struck by cyclones, the government helped people resettle, but because livelihood opportunities in those resettlement places were not necessarily compatible with what they knew, which was fishing, which was, you know, being connected to this, the urban economy, a lot of them actually returned or part of the household uh, members returned um, to Vera. In Lagos, um, which was the second city we looked at, um, you see that the economic factors um, were much more important motivation for people to want to move. Here again, you had a large share of people who actually did want to move, but mostly within the city and to improve their, their living situation. They're uh, getting into a better neighborhood and having better upward mobility, basically. And Alexandria was the only case where you see there was basically no observance of climate um, effects. So this is the left column here. Um, people basically said, we don't, we don't see anything, even though desk research suggests there was something happening there, there were some negative impacts. Um, and there was a very high um, proclivity to want to stay in Alexandria and in this neighborhood in particular. So my bottom line here is that even though I think we wanted to have a good coherent narrative across kind of cities in Africa, what we found from our field research and also from our modeling, which I'll go into next, is that there's actually quite a lot of diversity across cities and the situation varies across cities. Um, so this is our future projections. We followed a very similar approach to the World Bank um, haven that you cited at the top. Um, so this is similar to what was done for Groundswell. We, and we added a few more variables to the model, but fundamentally it, it follows a very similar approach. Um, and as Groundswell did, we also arrived at projections for increased future internal mobility. So within country across Africa, up to potentially 113 million people by 2050. That's the upper band of the projection. This would make up for about 5% of the population um, by 2050. This is how this is projected. The, these movements are projected to be um, distributed across the continent. So you have here what are called hotspots areas, um, origin and destinations, origin and red destinations in green. And you see that coastal areas, the Sahel belt, um, are coming out quite strongly, as well as certain border regions across uh, border areas are also quite prominent. And so we looked at this for different geographies, including for urban areas. What, what are our findings for the urban areas? Slightly surprising, the model suggested that climate mobility will actually net for all African cities lead to some reduction in urban population. Now, this is against the background, of course, of still very rapid urban growth. Um, but the model suggests that there could be a small dent in the urban population in the continent due to climate impacts. Um, this is a total at the maximum of four and a half million people. So it's relatively small compared to the population size in Africa, but that's the model projection. Um, growing cities that will see people leave because of climate um, are depicted here. And that suggests that you have a lot of people that will be in quite vulnerable places, basically. So these cities will be growing, there will be more people in them, and yet they will be experiencing quite significant climate risks um, by 2050. You see, um, Nigeria and Ethiopia come out here. And I think that's mainly a function of population growth like this. It's just a lot of population growth happening there. Um, these are the cities that will grow the most because of climate mobility and the cities that are actually projected to potentially lose population because of climate impacts. And here, I think interestingly, Nigeria actually is not so important in the sense that the population growth is less driven by climate change, climate change, climate impact mobility. Um, whereas you see the EGAD region and also the Northern African coast come out quite strongly. Oops, sorry. Um, this is just to underline again the point that the dynamics are quite different across different cities and it's not always intuitive. Um, 
So Maputo, for example, shows up for us as a destination area, even though it is on the coast and certainly vulnerable to climate risks. Um, same for Alexandria. Lagos, on the other hand, shows up as a climate origin, a climate mobility origin place. So some people are projected to leave Lagos due to increased um, flooding risk, flood risk. And in Freetown, we see projected movement actually within the city. So from one part of the city to another. So again, like the dynamics are different. And I think with, in each country, there's a, often an interplay also between like what happens in the inland if conditions get worse in the inland, the model will move more people to the coastal area. So um, that's, I think, how some of the um, results for Mozambique, for example, can be explained. What are the implications for cities? Um, this point has been made, but it comes out, I think, clearly from our findings that movement into urban areas is often movement towards uh, risk. So people are not necessarily escaping risk. They're maybe exchanging one set of risks for another set of risks. Um, actually, often government development still is driving uh, settlements in risky areas. Um, and if movement into cities isn't well supported or managed, it could actually exacerbate risks for the existing population. So we've heard from city officials quite a lot con quite a lot about concerns about deforestation, for example. So if people come into urban areas and settle on hillsides and cut down trees, that increases risk of um, uh, landslides, um, flooding. So, so, so these kinds of concerns are there. Um, so cities are destinations, but they also are vulnerable themselves. Um, and increasingly, I think they could concentrate vulnerability in the sense that people settle in these informal settlements that are um, more prone to experience um, negative impacts uh, from climate change, from, from hazards. Uh, so in cities, uh, it's often those poorer and more marginalized neighborhoods that are in areas that are most exposed and where people have the least resources to cope with shocks and changes of the environment. Um, and so cities are simultaneously dealing with having to uh, accommodate or set, uh, settle new people while also addressing the risk for people that are in the city. and. Um, considering if people that are settled should actually be moving. So you have to look at what is the displacement risk, but also are there people that are in hazardous areas and cannot move and need to be assisted to move? Um, so this whole question of relocation. Um, what are some of the response options? Um, we've worked, when working with cities, have kind of tried to, to frame those in three buckets. Um, one is around this question of how do you address the urban vulnerability and displacement risk in the city? Um, how do you build resilience for communities, whether that's through social protection, um, whether that's through um, physical infrastructure, um, but also making sure that people move through early warning, evacuation, and potentially then also more permanent relocation measures. Um, the second uh, set of policy responses or responses at the city level are around managing urban growth and the influx of people. Um, and I think there, there's on the one hand, a lot of experience in cities that have accommodated large inflows of people in the past. So I remember speaking with the city of Lima, for example, that has taken in almost a million Venezuelans. Um, and so there, there are experiences of how this can be managed without kind of, you know, projections of conflict and social strife. Um, but at the same time, and I think this was mentioned by Jiho, a lot of uh, Jinho, a lot of the um, cities that will be growing are actually not even cities now, they're towns. And so there's a lot of important, I think, of forward planning and putting an infrastructure in place before the city has grown. Um, lastly, um, cities have really tried to find um, ways of 
looking at their engagement around climate and looking at their engagement around migration as kind of two policy fields where they've positioned themselves as progressive leaders, as um, um, the ones who are actually doing the work on the ground um, and try to see how could um, their work on inclusive climate action, for example, be a way of in, uh, addressing increasing movement of people into cities, um, but also how could the movement of people into cities be an opportunity um, to attract urban investment, to, um, to uh, have economic growth um, opportunities. So this is very much you know, aspirational, I think, in a lot of cities, right? It's not necessarily what's happening now, but if we wanted to kind of paint a positive vision for what this could look like. I think a lot of it rides on harnessing kind of climate investment as an opportunity to get people new skills, um, give them jobs, um, but also to uh, uh, upgrade neighborhoods, reduce costs for poor neighborhoods for things such as water and energy. Um, so that's the positive vision. Um, and this was captured in the mayor's uh, agenda on climate and migration that I mentioned before. So this in the three buckets, urban resilience, urban inclusion, and urban transformation. Um, this is the recommendation on cities that we have made um, as part of our Africa climate mobility agenda for action, um, investing in resilient and connected cities. Um, and I think important to highlight here are some elements around the, the need for data at the city level um, and also the need for building ties across cities and cities in rural areas. So this speaks to the um, point I made earlier around increasing connectivity due to mobility of people. But also I think this um, idea that if you have a lot of smaller cities that are growing rapidly and need to scale up their services, are there ways for cities to pool certain functions, for example, to be able to deliver um, for people without having necessarily you know, a, a big budget at their disposal? Um, what are cities looking for oh, from my experience? Great. Yeah, this is the last slide. Brilliant. Um, uh, so basically a localization of data and projections, understanding what some of this means for them. Um, Decision-making power over key policy levers, such as land use planning and taxation. That's a recurrent um, point made, especially in Africa and African context. Um, involvement in policy making at higher levels, national adaptation planning, um, migration policies, um, and then direct access to funding and financing. So I'll conclude here. Thank you so much and sorry for being long. <laughs> No worries at all. Lots of, again, lots and lots of uh, very interesting and useful information, but again, a, a sort of different perspective, right, in terms of firstly, you know, challenging this idea of climate refugees, which is very much, you know, the priority narrative, I guess, in terms of the, which is not to say that climate refugees don't exist, but the the idea that people are moving because of the direct consequence of climate rather than of, you know, the consequences on their livelihoods, I think is a really important one. And also, of course, the particularity of differences between cities, including moving into risk. I think that's a really important um, takeaway message from me uh, from your presentation. So thank you very much for that. Um, a reminder, we've got some great questions and comments already in the Q&A. So if you do have any comments or questions for our speakers, I know there's one for Sarah, which we'll come back to, um, then please do put them in there. And we will make sure that we've got time for um, some discussion as well, because there's a lot to get our heads around in this uh, conversation. Um, thank you, Sarah. Much appreciated. I'm going to hand over now to our, our final uh, speaker, um, which, who is Dina Ionesco. Welcome, Dina. It's great to have you with us. Um, Dina is a senior advisor on migration at the Climate Mon Vulnerable Forum and the Vulnerable 20 Group. I'm not sure whether you're going to explain what those are, but I would really like to hear more. Um, and as in that role as senior advisor on migration, Dina leads activities that support countries commitments on migration and climate change across the climate migration human rights and sustainable development multilateral processes so in a way coming back out i guess from the local but really thinking about um the international picture in terms of how we might address some of the issues that have been raised um dina you've really worked previously on a, on numerous programs and and projects worldwide with a wide variety of donors with policymakers researchers and with migrants and communities as well 
what would you say based on what is a very complicated picture that we're hearing <laughs> what's the kind of most critical policy concern in this space and how at the international level uh, can we bring any of these you know more it's very hard to talk about complexity when you then need to have solutions right but i'm really intrigued to know how you think we go about getting those that complexity into the international policy space thank you thank you heaven i hope you hear me well we do and we we have to speak of complexity sorry sorry <laughs> Um, what I will try, and thank you for mentioning the Climate Vulnerable Forum, the V20. So the Climate Vulnerable Forum, it's a state-led uh, initiative that brings together 58 uh, countries that are among the countries most vulnerable to climate change. And the group of called V20, it's the finance arm of this group, so the finance ministers. So that's, um, uh, I am seconded, in fact, by IOM to the Climate Vulnerable Forum and V20 to work on their migration priority that was defined as a priority by the presidency of the CVF that it's now held by Ghana. And um, I have also a second hat, which is to, to lead a, a master degree that I co-created at Webster University, Geneva, on migration, environment, and climate change. And I'm just mentioning it because one of our courses in the next term is on urban issues, migration, and climate change, because we consider that as one of the key areas we need to understand and to address. What I find also important uh, to respond to your question, I will try to do maybe three things. Uh, first, to say a few like generic policy principles uh, that I come across from the work you mentioned, uh, I, um, I've been doing at policy and operational level and from the discussion we had until now, and then maybe some more higher level cross uh, cutting policy consideration and to end up with three key uh, I, I would define three key policy priority areas. So I'm trying to, to, to do something out of the complexity while not denying it. Um, so cities represent, in fact, in the world, more than 70% of the global green gas emissions. But the CVF 58 countries are uh, representing 1.5 billion people and just 5% of the em emissions. And they are the only group of countries that is for the moment compliant and aligned to the objective of 1.5 degrees in the Paris Agreement. So cities are really transformed by migration. And as we saw, they are prime destination for migrants. And they are also responding, in fact, in terms of migration governance, though I think it's very important to highlight that migration and asylum policies are still decided at national level and that migration governance remains very much um, uh, considered as a, at national level. And this is in a way extremely ironic or uh, important to understand in this ap approach we have of the complexity of of migration policy with the topic we address today, because when you look at the history, the way that um, the governance of environmental migration has progressed over the past 20 years, it has really progressed either at regional level or at local level. So at regional level with approaches such as the EGAT, for instance, free movement protocol, where that now has a recognition of uh, climate and disaster dimension or at local level, uh, where you have the most innovation happening in terms of services for migrants, reintegration, integration, connection to green jobs, blue jobs. So we are part of a bit this very um, contradictory uh, governance question where it still seems to be a key national uh, objective to manage migration, to govern migration, to develop multilateral policies of migration, and that it grows at regional and, and local level, in fact. It advances at local and regional level. The other thing I want to say in terms of introduction, it's really to look at this nexus of migration, climate, um, and cities from a human uh, development and a human security uh, perspective. So putting at the heart of the question the vulnerable um, groups, and we see it so clearly at um, 
migration at or towards urban levels with all the marginalized informal settlements that are the most in fact also exposed to natural hazards so we see uh, if we have to put first and foremost i think when we speak of this whole complexity to to make sense of it this human security lends to it to try to 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 advance uh, in a human way in a way um and the other point I want to say as an introduction, if you look at the development of policies over the past 10 years at multilateral level, maybe 15 years, let's say, the, there is really a turning point in multilateralism that can guide us, which is around 2015 with uh, all the agendas that have been um, endorsed by states, some of them negotiated like the Paris uh, climate agenda, but you have, of course, the SDGs, you have the urban agenda, the humanitarian agenda, human rights council resolutions, and that led the Addis Ababa finance also um, agenda, humanitarian one, and then the New York declaration that led to the G global compact on migration and the global compact on refugees. So there is somehow of a turning point where migrants in fact entered all these spaces and i think when we speak of policy on um, cities uh, and with a look in particular from the global south um, we have to take these first points into uh, consideration the first point i mentioned that they are only five percent of the emission Second point that it's still a question of national dimension, but it's regional and local that progress the most. The most. Uh, third, that we need to look with a human security lens. And fourth, that we have to connect all these um, policy agendas in terms of policy practice and implementation to be able, in the fact, to address such a huge challenge. So that was for a bit for my introduction, what I want to say today. Uh, the second bit of what I want to say, it's really a bit this cross-cutting policy consideration that I'm based also on what I heard before uh, from the previous speakers. So the first uh, policy consideration I wanted to bring the attention uh, of um, everyone today, it's really that our topic today, in fact, it's at the heart of what is contemporary, in fact, migration strategies. And that we see um, how everything is interconnected. In particular, one uh, area that I think we so very comes out from all the research that has been done over the past years, it's for instance, how much seasonal migration interacts in a complex way with urban migration, urbanization, with labor policies, with then back rural uh, development. And, and you have examples from the global south from everywhere. Uh, Niger uh, ranks lowest in the human development index. And then you have huge numbers of vulnerable farmers who leave the farms on a seasonal way from uh, the harvest and following the rains and most move to urban centers. And it's a, it's a seasonal. Um, and we go back into the discussion on migration also as an adaptation strategy. You have India, 30 to 100 million people migrate seasonally to cities. Uh, Ethiopia, you have so much of the, we, we discussed this of, of young farmers being pushed into temporary employment in cities. But you have also China, where you have so much uh, the cities that help them back balance somehow the incomes uh, from the farmer space. So that's one thing I wanted to highlight is how much when we speak of urban dimension, we speak in fact across the migration uh, spectrum, internal, international, uh, the connections are very important. The second uh, element cross-cutting I wanted to highlight is that we should not forget and take stock of what has happened during COVID we are out i hope of this pandemic and i would um, encourage everyone to read the the research we had done in iom with blog series that look at different elements of what we've learned about migration climate during the covid uh, pandemic and we have such i picked up for instance the example of kyrgyzstan that shows the the problems on challenges of a landlocked uh, mountainous country 
very much affected by the negative impacts of, um, of climate change, and where we saw that the pandemic meant much more than a complicated public health situation. It meant, again, a migration challenge and of very complex. So it's a lot about rural to urban uh, migration, but it's mixed up with pastoralism, international seasonal migration, and a huge impact on labor mobility to the Russian uh, uh, Federation that has back uh, uh, impact on the way migration shape and non-migration, the stop in seasonal migration shape back, in fact, the city and rural dimensions. Then the third cross-cutting element I wanted to bring to attention, it's really the human rights reading. As a basis to understand this topic, um, we, I think we are now in a new phase about talking about unpacking, in fact, human rights to understand migration and to understand displacement and to understand loss and damage and to understand urban development. And it's a very useful way to understand what we are talking about because you can take absolutely every single right and then put into perspective migration in the context of climate change and urbanization through each human right. You take education, housing, health, gender equality, clean environment, all of them, um, you then see the areas of policies that needs to be addressed. And there's also a very important dimension to it about equity and fairness at the level of the global south in comparison to other, um, uh, the global north, and the way we, we will look at um, committing to reach the 1.5 degree objective, but in a fair way. And there's a big change also on the inclusion of migrants, which we totally see in all the urban agenda um, work. So we have also the key urban agenda uh, that recognizes migrants as players of transformation at, rural, uh, at urban level. So it's also their inclusion that it's important. And the last, uh, <laughs> point that's cross-cutting before I go in my last presentation bit that it's the three areas of uh, climate uh, of uh, action I see as important it's because I want to say we are today on women's day yes everyone agrees we are on women's day because I heard a lot about it yesterday but I personally consider that absolutely every day it's women's day so I wanted really to make a point on cross-cutting issues of about women, but of course more beyond it about gender, because it's men and women, and I don't want to joke necessarily about such a key important element, but I think to look at migration cities and gender, it's extremely important, and you touched already upon this in your previous discussions. I have, for instance, the example of Bolivia, of, so from my research we had done uh, in uh, IOM for the, the uh, COVID-19 research we did, where we were looking at rural to urban migration trends and how the migration of working age men impacted then women uh, remaining in rural areas and assuming larger workloads in different kinds of activities, in particular agriculture, and impacting then also issues of productivity and really key issues then again about rural to urban migration that it's seasonal and that it's so connected to key other areas such as land tenure, for instance. So with this, I will uh, conclude with my three main um, um, areas of policy. I hope I, I can still do that. I'm still on time. So in terms of three key areas, I think they are quite simple. I selected simple ones. So the first one, it's the climate agenda and action. I think we saw a transformation since we have had 16 COPs with no migration, 26 COPs with no cities, and it took ages to have the social dimensions of climate change. And now I think the cities are leaders in bringing the social dimensions of climate change on the forefront. And with the negotiations, you always have the official negotiations agenda at the COP. And cities are not having a formal role in the UNFCCC process. Uh, they are official observers. 
but the language in the COP decision have so much evolved over the past years and the Glasgow Climate Pact recognizes the role of local and regional government. So there is a role to play in the formal negotiation agendas, which means for the global stock take, the ambition on the global adaptation goal. It means the operationalization of the loss and damage work program and finance, the task force on displacement work, the Santiago network work, the ambition on mitigation and on the national determined contribution. Cities can really strive to engage in the country's national determined contribution processes and to, to, to show really action on the ground. And there's a global convenient mayor's multilateral climate action playbook for local and regional governments that gives this um, space to cities to, to achieve this in, in the national climate plans. So there's the, really the, the, um, the whole work that it's in the negotiation. And then there's the outside negotiation agenda at COP where we'll have a lot on environmental sustainability, clean energy for displaced populations, uh, a lot of work that will require an active role, I think, uh, of the cities. So that's one top priority for the migration and climate change um, agenda at urban level to find concrete ways of uh, implementation. Then, of course, the second big area of priority is the migration agenda and the refugee agenda as well. Um, there is only two mentions of urban dimension in the Global Compact on Migration, uh, but the GCR also sees cities as primary uh, respondents to, to supporting refugees uh, integration, for instance. And at the last uh, International Migration Review Forum in May uh, in 2022, 36 cities worldwide have announced different intention to provide services and programs for refugees and migrants through the call to local action to implement the global compact. Um, and so there is also the, the Global Cities Fund for Migrants and Refugees that supports uh, African cities, led also by um, the Mayor's Migration Council. There's the Global Mayor's Action Agenda on Climate and Migration. At CVF level, we have one specific program that is called uh, Migrants for Climate that it has as an objective to highlight the role of migrants and diasporas in climate action, in particular in slow onset and global warming um, responses. And that touches again a bit on migration as a form of adaptation and facilitated form of migration of the Global Compact on Migration. And the last area of um, priority for policy, which I think demands maybe the most uh, transformational and innovative vision, and I think it's sometimes very difficult to see it as visionary, but it's where the needs are, it's finance. It's the finance question. So also with the CVF, one very interesting uh, um, agenda item uh, that is being developed is the um, uh, global shield against climate risks that's led by Germany and it's a V20 and G7 uh, together uh, initiative with a strong connection to, re to re resilience and to um, insurance issues, but that looks at closing the protection gap for also people communities that are affected by loss and damage, defining very clearly what it is loss and damage finance and how do you disburse it, how you define the needs. And there again, there is a key role, I think, for uh, city diplomacy and city uh, representatives and uh, urban planners and visionary people who work at city level on this very complex nexus. With this, uh, I stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dina. I mean, you said at the beginning of your presentation that you would stick with complexity, and I think that's exactly what you did, not least because 
the governance processes are themselves very complicated with a whole myriad of different actors. I mean, I think two things I really noted. One is the kind of difference governance levels in this. And uh, both you and Sarah have talked a lot about cities, and I think that's very important. And it was interesting to see the cities at the RMRF represented by the mayors. But um, as you say, most policy is made at the national level. And so we have this kind of challenge. And I think the other point that's kind of come out of your presentation, but actually would probably apply to all of them, um, is the problem of siloed policy responses. You know, migration tends to be dealt with within, you know, uh, home affairs departments, with some, uh, often with a securitization agenda. But in fact, these issues that we're talking about, you know, the processes interconnect, but the policies often don't. And so particularly in the space of urban development, it seems to me that's a really critical policy space for response. And yet migration policy is often oriented elsewhere. So I think, you know, you've added, again, more complexity to what is already a very complicated situation, but really highlighting um, the need for governance structures and responses to really engage with these complexities as opposed to sort of, you know, wish them away in some way. So um, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, everybody, for the presentations. It's been a really fascinating um, set of uh, over overviews of very different aspects. We have um, we have a lot of questions and comments, actually, in the in the Q&A function, just to say there is a slight technical error and you will see a lot of Jin Hu Chung uh, in the questions. It's not Jin Ho asking himself questions, but just that unfortunately his name has got attached to a lot of the um, <coughs> registrations. But anyway, um, I'm going to group the question slightly just because of uh, in the interest of time. <coughs> Excuse me. I think there's a question about gender, which you yourself raised, Dina, but we might you know, want to say a little bit more about um, gender. Perhaps, Jinho, you want to respond to that because I think the question came up uh, immediately following your presentation. Uh, so a question about gender and the way it's framed here is really uh, Laura's question, Laura Turkett, <coughs> would love to learn more about the gender dynamics. Can imagine that rural and women in rural areas face particular barriers in terms of land rights and livelihood, uh, but maybe less able to move. What happens when they reach cities? For example, I imagine the economic or employment opportunities are different to those available for men. So at different stages, I guess, gender um, will shape both the decision to move, the ability to move, and the opportunities when that movement is, is happening. The second set of questions is really about this kind of rural urban interface in terms of the movement itself. So we've got some questions around, you know, given that climate related migration is internal, what are countries in the global south doing in a way to mitigate the risk of that increased migration flows into urban areas. And we've heard it's much more complicated than that because there's movement also out of urban areas. But um, another question there uh, around the relationship between rural urban migration related to climate and then you know, related to other factors like, for example, um, conflict, but also the social conflict that's associated with climate, right? So you know, often the manifestation of um, climate changes through resource conflict or conflict over resources. So, I, you know, it's also a question about about how conflict and resource competition might shape the decision to move. Um, a question about, uh, you know, often presented as personal choice, but where does government resettlement programs fit into this discussion? Uh, lots of really interesting questions, which you can also read for yourself, of course. And then a couple of remarks about culture. You know, we talk often, to, often about economic factors, uh, and heard very clearly from Sarah how those drive migration decisions, but um, a comment about culture as a powerful resource for addressing climate change impacts. Um, so I'll kind of leave you in a way to tackle which questions you would like to tackle. There are some really interesting comments as well as questions in the mix there. Um, maybe I could come to you first, Jin Ho, if you want to take up any of those questions, but perhaps first the gender one, because that came immediately after your presentation. And try and keep, if you can, your, your responses short, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, and maybe let's tackle one or two initially rather than all of them. Jin Ho, did you want to come in on the gender question or any of the others? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, it is always great to be asked a by myself, because because uh, <laughs> I always yeah I always question myself uh, for everything. Um, yeah, thank you for raising the issue of gender and women. I mean, obviously, this is really really critical. I mean, especially in rural Ethiopia, I just I, I can come up with the the case study that I I presented. Um, in the case of Ethiopia, in especially in rural areas, it's very traditional and hierarchical and patriarchal society and. And obviously, legally, the, um, the everyone in, between men and women, they have right to claim their land inheritance. But obviously, in practice, I mean, the, the, the men tend to inherit way more than women because, um, I mean, they, they have a kind of culture that actually son, they, they support their parents uh, when they get old. 
and not able to uh, work in the farm. So the parents often prefer their sons to take over their land rather than their daughters. And so what happened is uh, often there are, I mean, also women, uh, especially the girls in their teens are quite uh, moving to cities. Uh, and this decision is not only made by individuals, but at the family level, because also actually what we found is that in urban areas, the women's job security is sometimes higher than men's job security because Ethiopia has a very strong culture of having housemaid, even in a lower income household. So they often work as a housemaid in a, in a in other household. And then if they are accepted by the family, they often stay there for many, many years. So often they have a higher job security and then they can leave there and also receive small amount of income. And then they often send those income to their rural homes uh, to support their parents. But also during my field research, what I found is that many girls in their teens want to run away from the traditional rural society because there are often arranged marriages with, and then also there are very uh, also limited education opportunities uh, provided to women or sometimes the parents, they wouldn't let their daughters go to school, but instead they look after the livestock. So the, the, those girls in their teens have a kind of, um, kind of image of urban areas that they can go to school and, and, and they, they can do uh, for their career development. Uh, so this is kind of issue. Uh, and then also, but obviously when they arrive in cities, actually it is often, it's quite common that they are not able to go to school. So because they are stuck in the, those households as a housemaid. And then, so they often struggle. And then what I recently heard is that now, because of the, I mean, before the pandemic, obviously there was a construction boom in, in the big cities in Ethiopia. So now many women actually are also working at the construction site as unskilled manual laborers. So this is a kind of new um, phenomenon uh, observed quite recently. I think for, for the gender issue, I can cover to this extent. If any Thanks. other panelists want to cover, yeah. Thank you, Jinho. Does anybody else want to come back specifically on the gender point? Dina, Dina and then Sarah, and then Roman. Hey, everyone. No, from the gender point of view, I just wanted to highlight um, research on uh, male vulnerability and how important it is to not lose this, how contextual it is, and that there is increasing interest in understanding uh, male vulnerability in the context of climate change, in particular, um, considering extreme heat and global warming and connection to labor issues and health, and the issue of um, working in mining and construction, um, special domains that are uh, extremely difficult because they expose people, in particular, to the, the heat uh, dimension. So there is also a research on how the global fires have affected more at labor level uh, the male population and also on mental health and uh, male vulnerability. So I, I really think we have to be extremely cautious about this and to, to never forget um, also looking contextually at, at everyone. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. absolutely. And seeing this as being about gender relations rather than necessarily just the particularities of certain groups. Certainly in the MIDEC research, I mean, you know, the the work in Nepal, for example, in, in terms of migrants, male migrants predominantly in Qatar uh, in relation to the World Cup um, building program. I mean, almost it's hard to know what the causes of deaths were, of course, of people being, but there were many Nepali deaths and many of them were related to heat exhaustion. And I think it just highlights your your point, Dina, about having a human rights perspective in, in terms of how we look at this and uh, foregrounding, as, as you suggested, Roman, the well-being of migrants themselves, rather than just talking about the movement in these abstract terms. Um, Sarah and then Roman on the gender question, and then we'll come back to some of the other points in the chat. Yeah, just briefly, I think from our research, there was um, some different patterns for kind of slow onset versus sudden onset disasters. So in the case of sudden onset disasters, it was generally reported that women and children are the first to be moving. Um, so when a cyclone hit Bera, for example, it would be the kids and the women being sent uh, away first. 
but in the context of slow onset um, uh, effects, there was more of a reluctance of women mostly to move. So they were kind of the last movers. So maybe just to highlight that um, distinction that we've observed. That's a very, very interesting point. Thank you. Roman. Yeah, uh, not wanting to add more complexity to the whole topic, but um, what we often see is that there's really an intersection notion to these kind of patterns so that it's not only kind of difference that we see uh, by between men and women, for example, but also like by different age groups um, that are intersecting with these uh, dynamics that we see. Um, for example, we have done a study in the uh, Indian Himalayas where it was uh, primarily older, older uh, women who, who were staying in the, in the villages, whereas uh, both younger men and women were moving out. Um, and then also um, uh, uh, men in general had a higher propensity to move out. So I think that's an interesting point as well as what uh, Jin Ho has said about kind of considering the entire family uh, situation and the position of the different um, members of the households within the family. Um, and also maybe to, to reflect once more that mobility is not only economic e economically driven, but there's other motivations for becoming mobile and uh, also here we, we, we see, of course, also a strong uh, gender um, influence, for example, when we talk about marriage migration um, and, and other forms of, of mobility in that direction. Yeah, thank you, Roman. I mean, I think this point about intersectional inequalities is, is really important. I mean, it's certainly, again, a, a sort of focus of MIDEX work because we have these work packages that look at issues of gender at age and age and, and issues of income and, and poverty. But I mean, you know, it, it's very hard often to sort of look at them singularly. You end up looking at them as intersectionally um and i think your point i think you made it earlier as well about uh, migrant decision making i mean this is not particular to the climate uh, related migration space i think in the migration decision making literature there's plenty of evidence about the complexity of migrant decision making the gender dynamics of that the roles of spirituality and other forms of you know socially important uh, factors that are often ignored in this economic discussion and yet again it's sort of not really reflected in this climate related mobility debate because it's sort of reduced to almost a very simple sort of you know there's a climate event or an onset event and then people just decide to move um, and we can see from your result re researcher all of you that, that that's actually not uh, how it works in practice and, and it's I think it's a reflection of the migrant decision making uh, issue more generally that's it's again very simplistic um can I stick with you, Roman, and ask whether you want to pick up any of those questions about the rural urban kind of migration shift, either in terms either in terms of the dynamics of that and some of these additional factors like conflict over resources, or indeed in terms of the policy responses to that at a, at a kind of government or national level? And then I'll take that question. Yeah, I think I maybe you would, uh, would pick up on the question uh, related to the, the uh, rural urban link and kind of what what uh, authorities are trying uh, like uh, to achieve. We have been involved in a number of projects where merely getting a better understanding um, uh, of, of how these uh, moves look like and, and to get a bit of a forecasting uh, perspective or a, a, a forward-looking perspective on some of these topics uh, was really a priority for, uh, for some also of the, of, the, of the city governments, municipal uh, authorities. Um, and that links uh, to some of the points that Sarah made that kind of gaining a better capacity also to, like, to, to, to collect data to process data and to gain an understanding of, of which areas may experience uh, 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 stronger, greater outflows in the future and where may people move to, I think that is a very important point. I would like to briefly uh, touch up on a, a second uh, question or comment that I saw in the chat related to the links of different types of, of, of migration mobility flows. Um, and this is, of course, a very interesting um, question that is also challenging for us researchers to kind of identify to what extent different types of, of, of mobility are potentially linked and can potentially interact with each other, influence each other. That's a bit of a black spot. There is some literature that shows, for example, that the countries that have more internal migration measured as urbanization, which as we as we discussed before, is maybe not a perfect proxy for, for that. They have larger um, out migration also in terms of international migration but there's only very spotted evidence on, on these uh, issues but I think that's a quite an interesting um, field of research um, where there's some ongoing projects that uh, are very exciting and looking into that. Thanks Roman. Sarah can I come back to you on this point about the kind of role of, of, of mayors and cities you know what 
in reality, I mean, I, I, I'm guessing that, that mayors and city leaders are grappling with, you know, dealing with their own kind of issues in the city themselves. And so the kind of, you know, preventing people from coming to cities is not really in their brief, but also it's not something that can easily be done. But what's the dynamics between the cities and the the areas from which people are coming? Is is there any kind of policy joined upness between between those areas from your ex experience? Thanks. Yeah. Um... It's interesting. I think um, from the cities that I've been engaged with, and these are mainly kind of like big cities, right, that engage in these like international processes. Um, I would say that there's been actually less of a focus on kind of the, the networking with their uh, cities of origin, if you will, <laughs> and more of a focus on networking with peer cities um, uh, in other countries or learning kind of uh, from cities in other contexts. I've also seen what I found quite interesting, cities really being quite aware. Um, this is uh, kind of large international cities where they're like, um, you know, we, we if a disaster happens anywhere in the world, we're going to be affected because we will have people from that place on earth in, in our city, right? Um, so, so there is, I think that awareness of like, because we have these connections, we have a certain amount of responsibility or leverage also that, that we can decide to act upon or not, right? And it, I think it depends a lot on the city leadership, whether they see this as an opportunity. Um, but I think for, for these kind of more, how do you address kind of rural urban dynamics through um, maybe city networks? My impression is that um, the only place that I've seen uh, very deliberate attempts were in Bangladesh, where I think there's a deliberate strategy to try to kind of um, support secondary cities or smaller cities as, as kind of destination areas to take some pressure off Dhaka as the main kind of a hub. Um, but I, I would agree with um, Dina's assessment. I mean, there's, I think, a lot of to be said for looking at multi-level um, governance, right? And um, the work that we want to do going forward in Africa is very much geared to kind of bringing down this evidence that I presented to the country and also local level. So to look at how do we inform national adaptation plans? How do we inform nationally determined contributions? by making this evidence um, you know, relevant for the local and for the national context. And in that process also, hopefully creating a dialogue at country level where the local and the national sit at the same table to discuss these issues. So that's what we are hoping to do going forward. Um, and I think it is very much like, you know, mayors and cities can do a lot of things and some have more powers than others but oftentimes they are still very much dependent on national government. Um, and so I think there is a way in which they use the international also to lever have, have more leverage with the national level, right? Like that's an interesting dynamic, but, um, but the, at the end of the day, I think it's, it's hard for cities to do something against the national. Oh, for sure. Just picking up on that that point, Dina, I wonder if I could just ask you as well, and this is slightly, uh, it's not a question that's necessarily in the chat, but I mean, one of the things that strikes me very much from many of these either intergovernmental processes or multilateral processes more generally is that you've still got this gap between what happens at the policy level and what happens in practice, right? And what's really striking when you spend any time in cities in the South is the kind of the dynamism, the social dynamism that you know was referring to in his presentation. You know, they have a kind of life, right? Um, people are coming, things are happening, people are moving. It's hard to sort of apply a very planned approach sometimes in those contexts because there's already a kind of very rapid process underway. How do you have any thoughts on how to bridge that gap between the aspirations of of, of the kind of policy process and what's the reality of what's happening in cities at the moment? No, I really think that there are two different and times so you have really that a multilateral policy development that is different from time of migration time of action and that ties up a bit with the question on personal choices versus uh, different government or local authority driven processes um i don't know what the 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 <laughs> the solution is because i really think that these processes have a different life they have a different objective. We need multilateralism. It takes long time because there are always stages. It's first uh, trying to get the, 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 an agreement and then there's an anchorage phase. And then it's up to the action to, to enter into uh, 
into, into the process and for many different actors to use this anchorage. And it's as much for cities as for diasporas and migrants themselves. It's as much for the non-governmental organizations. I really think the action level then goes into a different time and, and a wide range of, of solutions. And you, you, you see at the COPs exactly these two times going in parallel. You have the time of the negotiations that take ages, like now we will be finally in operationalizing the Santiago network. It took ages to arrive to a change in loss and damage finance, many years of efforts. And then the action, it's outside, in fact, this. The action will be there. It's about commitments, political commitments, multilateralism. The action is driven by a wide range of actors. So I, I would say this, and I, I really see the regional level on this topic as the most dynamic one. Uh, you, if you look last year, there was the Kampala Declaration for Migration and Climate for the East Africa region. You have the Pacific uh, evolving with a new um, framework uh, addressing human mobility and climate change. It's progressing much more at this regional multilateral level than the, the global one, I think, in terms of action. I think that's yes. a very, very important point about the regional level. Um, I'm going to take one more well round of sort of comments slash questions. And just to say for those that have asked, yes, the presentations um, hopefully will be made available. There'll be a policy brief and the recording. So for those people who either want to catch up on the complexity or just uh, see it who haven't had a chance to be here, that will be made available. Um, just a couple more comments. Uh, one from Mary Citrana. Um, thank you for the excellent presentations. This issue she's raising is about um, displaced people settling in between urban and peri-urban spaces. So we've been talking here about urban rural and of course, you know, large and small cities, but of course we've got these peri peri-urban areas, uh, which may, you know, again, people don't just move necessarily to cities, they move in a stepwise um, way. So I think that's that would be interesting to hear more about that. We talked a little bit about the gender issues that's, that Mary also um, raised. Um, again, around the kind of the issue of culture and other kind of more traditional patterns of, of resilience around security strategies. Um, I think the, the points are very well made in the chat about those things, and we'll try and capture them if we can in the policy brief. Um, temporal, seasonal, rural, urban migration and off-farm season uh, migration. Again, is there, should there be any kind of policy response to that? This kind of migration has existed for, you know, centuries, uh, millennia, as long as we know, but of course it's being shifted by some of the, um, the climate, climate changes that are happening. But is there a role then, you're, you're intervening then in what also are very long-standing social relationships, right? And ways of living, not just in, the migration space. Um, and finally, another question from another Jin Ho Chung. There are many in the list. <laughs> um, maybe to add to the discussion, there are some research on migration in West Africa, especially in uh, Senegal and, and Mali, that found urban rural to urban migration is very masculine. So people move, send money back home when they succeed. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think just re-emphasizing the gender point that actually there are sort of social values and capital attached to migration, which is, you know, differentiated by, by gender as, as well. So some really interesting comments in the chat, as well as some kind of questions that are in there for us. Should we have one last round? Um, and maybe in that last round, if you want to conclude by any kind of take takeaway messages that you want to leave us with. Um, so Dina, let's start with you, seeing as you were the last to speak. Uh, keep it short if you can, just in the interest. Okay. So <laughs> seasonal, mig yeah, seasonal migration, I think it's key that what, what comes out of the COVID situation. That's what has been maybe the most questioned and put into question by what has happened. So we have there a lot of examples of its importance and the connection to other forms of migration. Uh, the questions on personal choices versus collective policy level response, I think it's very interesting to follow up on this, also looking at planned relocation in the context of climate change. And I encourage everyone to look at the 78 country case studies that have been um, mapped and that uh, we just had the platform on disaster displacement advisory group. So the, the documents were, were shared. It's uh, very interesting cases and really about touching the last thing, which I saw in the chat. And I think it's extremely important. It's all the non-economic heritage, indigenous population, culture, um, and art. Art was mentioned as well. So I want to end up my presentation today uh, on art 
um, and culture and understanding loss and damage or non-economic losses, it's extremely complex. And I really think that, again, human rights can help us understand what we are really talking about. But the culture, art um, are different ways to go into action by staying in a more human and emotional dimension that I think we should never forget. So thank you for the question. And yeah, thanks. and thank you for the points, Dina. I think they're, they're well made and well taken. Um, Sarah, I'll come to you next, either to tackle some of the questions or to make a, a kind of concluding point of your own. Yeah, I think there, um, there were some questions around, um, yeah, the, the livelihoods versus um, with those climate drivers. And, and I think it's, it is extremely difficult to disentangle. Um, th they are very much interrelated. And so I think um, there's also uh, still challenges, I think, in, in the modeling, for example, that we've done and, and going forward, <laughs> hopefully there'll be improvements, but you know, to integrate some of these connections between climate drivers, their impacts on the economy, <laughs> the economy's impacts on movement. Uh, I mean, like, the, you know, like the, to get really get at that like level of complexity, I think will will help us actually improve, you know, these forecasts. And, um, and I do think that um, whilst I guess like a government attempts to kind of like stall migration usually fail, um, I think the question of whether government attempts to kind of channel migration in some ways um, is maybe more open still. Um, my colleague uh, is Moroccan and he always tells me that Morocco has very successfully kind of implemented a development strategy around multiple poles in the country. So not having one city that attracts everybody, but having multiple cities that can be attractive destinations for people. And so I think this question around like, and this is not a city policy agenda, right? That's a national policy agenda. But I think this question around like, how do you achieve more um, uh, um, balanced uh, development across the territory, taking into account climate risk factors in the future will be a big question for, for uh, countries. But it also, I think, then ties back to, you know, another a lot of other grievances that exist in countries. So it's also an opportunity for addressing some of these questions of like, why are certain areas underinvested in? Why are certain groups not represented enough, right? Like, so we get into a lot of these fundamental issues. Um, so I think from this question of how do we um, take pressure off some of the most, uh, you know, um, uh, uh attractive cities we get to like much larger issues of like uh equitable development in countries absolutely no it's a, it's a very important point and i think this issue of you know what often happens in terms of migration policy responses is to sort of in some way stop or respond to the migration itself but actually providing social protection or other opportunities for people to have a choice not to move you know people often would choose not to move given that choice um but you know i think that opens up again a whole bunch and a whole range of different policy arenas in into which you know energy could be and resources could be poured so i think that's a, a very important point um roman would you like to chat, chat tackle any of the questions or just make some concluding uh, points of your own there's you know there's a, a lot of interesting stuff in there but uh yeah i would just maybe briefly um uh, tackle or address one of the questions related to uh basically urban sprawl and uh, if people are like moving in, in different steps or basically into different locations also in the surrounding of cities i think that's a very interesting question also to look at how intra-urban dynamics look like in in the context of this uh, of this topic and also something which is again data wise very hard um to uh to to look at because we're missing the the high resolution data um especially when looking at comparative uh, perspectives and but definitely something very interesting um to 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 not only see whether people are basically moving from outside of city but also to understand better how um movements um, and dynamics look like uh, within a city context um, maybe to briefly summarize with uh, maybe the main important main points um, um, I would like to once more um, re-emphasize this uh, uh, focus on the well-being as I as I think this is really something critical to kind of keep in mind let's say the the vulnerability of population groups and to have always uh, focus also on the well-being and uh, resilience of these uh, of these people against the background of uh, climatic changes and 
the need for a holistic perspective to understanding this climate mobility topic, um, a perspective that connects basically the multiple forms of, of mobility that we have uh, discussed uh, today, but also understanding that origin and, and, and destination areas are intrinsically linked and that one really needs to have a, a broad view on this topic to understanding to understanding it in its uh, in its complexity. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. Completely agree on that one. Um, finally, Yin Ho, do you want to just uh, make a concluding remark or respond to any of the points that have been raised? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I can tackle one question as a kind of my my final remark because um, I mean there was a question whether the government has a kind of strategy to to kind of uh, control this mobility of people who are coming into cities and and um, obviously Ethiopia has a very tragic history of controlling people's mobility and they had a kind of government-led resettlement program that have relocated like a million people from the north to the south and then the, many of them have died because they they couldn't adapt themselves into the new environment and tropical um, the environment. So, I mean, when, when it comes, and also there was a kind of record that actually um, the if they provide food aid continuously to a certain region and then they uh, have harsh climate change and then they often have a less um, mobility than the people who don't have a food aid uh, because they knew that food aid is coming so they will rather stay there rather than going to some air so this is kind of way of controlling people's mobility could be uh, quite uh, risky and dangerous uh, there's also uh, because they have this migration pattern historically and a seasonal migration as we discussed and then this is a part of smallholder farming in Ethiopia and also uh, when I had an interview with um, the Addis Ababa bureaucrat uh, or the go government officers, uh, they were thinking that actually those migrants coming into the cities as a kind of pain in the neck uh, because they are invisible, they come seasonally and they go. And then so this is really hard for them to sort of uh, to recognize how many people are coming and, and living, how long they stay in the cities. And so it is, it is quite important to recognize the seasonal migrant as a their life livelihood method and also i i wanted to the stress that also the um it's um there are so many already policies implemented in both rural and urban areas that limiting people's mobility um it's, it's, it's really really hard for them to get citizenship if they move to urban areas uh, especially in the case of Ethiopia, it's almost impossible, and and then they wouldn't have any access to to health and education infrastructures, and and then then they would go back to their hometown to get health services. So it, it, it is, and also there was, um, as you probably know, that the EU Emergency Trust Fund for Africa. I mean, it, it, the Ethiopia was the third largest recipient of this fund, and they have received like several hundred million euro to, 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 to limit and control people's mobility so that they don't go to Europe. Uh, so this, this is kind of uh, policy already implemented and then, and then we need to probably review and we need to see how mobility works for people's livelihood uh, sustainably. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for raising that point. I mean, this, you know, the we've heard a lot in the presentations today about mobility as a sort of strategy for resilience, albeit, you know, with the constraints and the potential challenges and risks that it brings. But, uh, you know, your point is very important that in the more in the broader political discourse, particularly in the global north, mobility is perceived to be, well, perceived to be a problem, although many people in the north move as well, of course, but there are unequal opportunities to move and unequal narratives or inequitable narratives about the the rights and privileges of that movement as well. So I think that's a, a broader point about narratives that are really influencing our policy um, engagement on this on this issue. Listen, it's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, I feel like, you know, even two hours is not quite enough, especially given the kind of layers of complexity that you've revealed. But um, I'm really very grateful to your presentations and to, you know, the conversation that we, you know, is already ongoing in many spaces, but is not in all spaces. And this way of, uh, of you know, bringing this more nuanced perspective onto the topic. So um, I'm sure our our, um, our participants would also like to thank you in the kind of, you know, 
virtual online <laughs> round of applause and uh, really very much um, appreciated. Thank you as well to the audience for your engagement and contribution. And thanks to the team at UNUCPR, particularly Jack Durrell and um, Jacob Entoiwa for um, supporting us with the, with the technical side. Uh, there are, however, multiple Yin Ho Chungs still uh, on the list. So we will make sure that we, uh, we get you the policy brief for those that are interested. And also if you want to sign up to future migration uh, policy roundtables, please do let us know and we'll add you to our mailing list. Uh, really appreciated. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your days of your evenings, uh, wherever you are. And uh, yeah, hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much.